Did Jesus clearly announce his suffering and death to his disciples? Or did his arrest, crucifixion and reported resurrection take them completely by surprise? These questions are far more significant than we might initially think. In the Christian Gospels, Jesus repeatedly foretells his death and resurrection to his closest followers. I'll give you a few examples to give you a feeling, a sense of what uh, is involved. In Matthew chapter 16, it reads, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must undergo, he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, it said. Peter understood what he was saying. And then in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, we read, Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And I'll give you just one last example because there are a number of them from Mark chapter 10. He took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the, chief, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, and spit upon him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days he will rise again. So these are really explicit, detailed, precise predictions repeatedly made by Jesus to his disciples. Um, hopefully that point is clear. So what, how can one deal with this? How does an objective historian uh, consider these uh, statements in the Gospels? Are they historical? Are they uh, invented sayings? How are we to understand them? And to help us explore this issue, I want to... Uh, look at this book, Giza Vermesh, that's how it's pronounced, The Authentic Gospel of Jesus. Now, um, Giza uh, Vermesh uh, is a scholar specialising in ancient Judaism and early Christianity. He's best known for his complete translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls into English, and his research focuses on the Dead Sea Scrolls and other ancient Hebrew writings in Aramaic and on the life and religion of Jesus. Uh, Vermes uh, is one of the most important contemporary uh, uh, Jesus research scholars and has been described as the greatest Jesus scholar of this generation. So uh, he, he is a, a professor at Oxford uh, University. So he writes um, a section on this in his book, starting on page 385. And I want to share his insights with you. I think it is, uh, what he says is actually really interesting and sheds a very different light on this whole question of whether or not Jesus made these predictions in the first place. And I'll let you judge for yourself whether or not you find his argument persuasive. I personally do. I think most biblical scholars actually do, but that's a different subject. He says, the predictions, which I've just read, are not mysterious. On the contrary, they are expressed in plain words. One of the Gospel writers explicitly stresses that Jesus intended to be understood and his words remembered. Let these words sink into your ears. Luke 9.44 In sum, we are left in no doubt that the apostles had been put in the picture by Jesus about the forthcoming happenings, not once or twice, but several times. On the other hand, how did these same apostles and disciples react when the predicted events began to materialise? They certainly showed no foreknowledge of the scenario. When Jesus was arrested, all his companions fled. See Mark 14.50. When confronted, Peter even denied that he had anything to do with Jesus or even that he knew him. Mark 14.66. None of the apostles, or for that matter any member of the family of Jesus, accompanied him to Golgotha, according to the synoptics. Golgotha is the place of crucifixion, the place of the skull, as it's called. After the death of Jesus on the cross, the apostles do not seek comfort in the thought that in three days' time all would be well. On the contrary, when the women had gone to the tomb, 
to complete the burial rites reported that the body of Jesus had disappeared, they encountered only total disbelief, voiced with the customary male superiority of the age. In fact, for the apostles, the words of the women were Leros. Now, this is Luke 24, 11. Now, I've looked up Leros in, because uh, I can read the Greek, in my uh, Greek lexicon of the New Testament. And Leros uh, means silly talk, nonsense. Silly talk, nonsense. Okay, so that's what the word means in English. So for the apostles, the words of the women were silly nonsense, Luke 24, 11. According to Luke, neither of the two disciples travelling to Emmaus nor the apostles in Jerusalem recognised Jesus when he appears to them after his resurrection. In Matthew's totally different account of the manifestation of the, of the risen Jesus is to, is to his 11 disciples on the Galilean mountain. Even some of these are said to have doubted. So even after he appeared to them, according to Matthew, some or all, depending on which translation you use, still doubted that it was him. Would people who had been assured in advance by their charismatic and prophetic teacher that the tragic events would be followed promptly by a happy ending have displayed such profound incredulity? Even allowing for the momentary shock and natural fear caused by the, the arrest of Jesus in the depth of the night, the apostles should surely have recalled the sequence of events so often and so recently rehearsed before them by Jesus. These are very good points that uh, Giza Amish makes, I think. And there's more. Hence, he says, the irreconcilable descriptions in the Gospels present us with the following dilemma. Either Jesus did not predict his fate and the cowardly behaviour of the disoriented disciples resulted from natural distress, weakness and disarray, or he actually forewarned them, in which case the inglorious conduct of each one of the apostles is inexplicable and the distorted canvas must surely be made entirely of the writers of the Gospels. Weighing up the pros and cons, it is easier to account for the latter insertion of inauthentic predictions than to provide a believable explanation for the undignified conduct of the closest associates of Jesus, possessing full foreknowledge of the events to come. Ah, this is a very good point. The greatest difficulty in which the subsequent decades, in the subsequent decades, facing the apostles and the early Christian missionaries was how to explain to Jews and to Gentiles the death and resurrection of Jesus. It should be recalled that neither the death nor the resurrection of the Messiah formed a part of the beliefs and expectations of the Jews in the first century AD. Now this is Giza Vermish's area of speciality. So no Jews at that time expected this. But actually, uh, we know from other evidence, and I mentioned this before, that no Jew prior to the rise of Christianity ever thought that the Messiah uh, would suffer and die and rise again on the third day. It simply didn't exist. So the apostles, he continues, and the evangelists, that's the authors of the Gospels, endeavoured to account for his death and this death and resurrection and to make them acceptable by asserting that Jesus had full knowledge in advance of them that he conveyed this knowledge to his disciples and that the subsequent events simply fulfilled his own predictions. As is well known, the chief method adopted by the spokesmen of the early church in order to prove their message about the messiahship of Jesus was to show that his story was prefigured in the Bible, that's the Jewish Bible, and consequently foreordained by God. The teachers of the Dead Sea Scroll, by the way, he's the world's leading expert on this, the teachers of the Dead Sea sect used the same technique known as Pesha interpretation. That's P-E-S-H-E-R, Pesha interpretation. In the persons and events of the Qumran community, the ancient predictions were realised. In retrospect, a similar fulfilment exegesis was inserted by the Gospel writers into their narratives regarding Jesus' suffering, death and resurrection. In other words, it's not really there, but they read it into the story. 
In addition to Jesus' own announcements regarding his end, Mark and Matthew make him allude to the prophecies foretelling his arrest. For the Son of Man goes as it is written, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, Mark 14, 21. They put words into Jesus' mouth, but let the scriptures be fulfilled, Mark 14, 49. Or, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so, Matthew 26, 54. Elsewhere, in an ambiguous way, Mark's Jesus asks, How is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? Mark 9.20. In turn, the Jesus of Luke remarks, Everything that is written of the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Luke 18.31. And his, and his risen Jesus also declares, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Luke 24.46 It is highly remarkable, says Giza Vermish, however, that none of these allusions actually cite the biblical passages in which the death and resurrection of Jesus are supposed to have found their realisation. They don't quote the passage ever where this is says, where this allegedly is cited. Nor does Paul reproduce any quotation from the holy books to support the claim that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. That's 1 Corinthians 15.3. This shows that the acceptability of the teaching concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus increases if it is assumed that these events had been foretold not just by him but also by the prophets long before him. And finally, Giza Vermish mentions, in consequence, Jesus' Jesus's appropriate predictions were incorporated into the gospel narrative. This, the, inter the interpolation, was then accompanied by further adjustments to make the behaviour of the apostles look less perplexing. But gospel writers tried to excuse them by remarking that they could not understand Jesus and that the meaning of the words was concealed from them, Luke 18, 34. Why would God conceal, you know, Jesus makes these predictions and then God promptly conceals them from the, from the disciples' understanding. It doesn't make much sense. The apostles are made to pretend that they had no idea of what rising from the dead signified, Mark 9, 10. Although by the first century idea, ID, AD, the concept of resurrection was common currency amongst the Jews. So this is the world's leading expert on first century Judaism. They all, everyone knew what it meant, the resurrection of the dead, but uh, Mark 9, 10 tries to make out that they had no idea what it meant. The disciples' failure to ask Jesus for an explanation was due to their being too distressed, Matthew 17, 23, or too frightened, 9.32 of Mark. Amazingly, it is even implied that some of them had simply forgotten the predictions. We learn that the angelic informants encountered the women in the empty tomb had to remind them of Jesus' prophecies and all of a sudden they remembered his words, Luke 24.6. To give a semblance of coherence to their version of the story, the Gospel writers demand the apostles pay a high price. They are portrayed as obtuse and spineless. In other words, as idiots. So that's uh, Giza Vermish's uh, rebuttal, and I think he makes a brilliant point. It doesn't make any sense historically and psychologically, uh, and the Gospel stories have retrospectively read back into their narrative these predictions which were made up after the event to give a kind of coherence that God is in charge of all this. So I hope you find that of interest. Do let me know what you think. Uh, feel free to disagree. Um, and there we are. Till next time.